Welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast, where hunters new and old come to learn and find inspiration from stories of hunts gone by. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the outdoor way of life, and there is no better time to start than right now. So let's head into the great outdoors with your host, Dylan Ray. Welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast, as always, presented by our good friends over at Scentlock and, of course, Blocker Outdoors, which I know uh, Fred is a huge fan of. And so, guys, I would just highly encourage you, uh, if you haven't checked out the Scentlock line or the Blocker line, head over to those uh, websites and check them out. Um, we're recording on Black Friday. I know once this airs, you'll have missed Black Friday, but um, some really good sales going on, maybe extending into this week. So uh, definitely head over and check out those websites. Um, Scentlock, what what they've come out with that I'm excited about is their 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 new colorway is black. So you can buy all their, uh, not all of their, but you can buy a lot of their pieces of the BE1 toolkit in black. So if you hunt from blinds, uh, that's super good. Um, so I would, I would highly recommend you to go check those guys out. I've got a special guest, a uh, guy I'm always uh, pleased to talk with, a pleasure to talk with, Mr. Fred Eichler. Fred, how are you, man? I'm doing absolutely great, man. Sounds like it. You've shot like 97 animals in the last two weeks, so you've got to be doing good. <laughs> I've, it's been it's been pretty incredible, man. It really has. It's uh, I, I got a beautiful mule deer just the other day uh, on video, which was an amazing one. I, you know, just with that new bear, I think this year so far, mountain lion, three deer, two elk, three bears antelope mountain lion, turkeys hogs it's been a heck of a year man it's wow. been one of those you know sometimes you sometimes you, you you don't feel like you or you feel like man I'm, I'm struggling a little bit or you know you're only shooting close shots or you know but this year for me it's just been uh man if i if i let the string go something's dying somewhere oh i got a beautiful caribou too up in uh newfoundland that was just a few weeks ago so i forgot that too yeah then that was <laughs> awesome footage which really gets me excited because i was wearing a for all that stuff, I was wearing a GoPro, so uh, the the angle, seeing seeing the bow come back, yeah. seeing that that new arrow I've been working with Easton on, you know, and just you could see the arrow hit all the animals and watch them drop. I think almost all of them, most of them dropped within view of the GoPro, which was really cool too. Like the big mule deer I shot the other day, he made it. He was thirty three yards, and I think he made it forty five or fifty yards and dropped right in front of me. So yeah, in answer, I. I'm all pumped up because it has been an amazing year. Heck, I've already skinned an elk already this morning, buddy. So I've been I've been going hard. That's awesome. You know you're having a good season when you forget a caribou and you're like, oh yeah, I shot a good caribou too. <laughs> like that's how, that's how you know. That's how you know it's been a good year when you're naming them off and and you accidentally leave out a caribou. Like sometimes <laughs> I leave out a doe or something. I'm like, oh, I, for, I did shoot a doe the other day, but you leave out a caribou. So. That's how you know you're having a good year right there. <laughs> it, it's been great, man. It really has been. And it's been a lot of fun, you know, just, you know, some cool people and, you know, some great hunts, you know, with the boys. And, and that's always fun. Family hunts are always fun. And then, you know, just the normal travel hunt. So it's been, it's been great, man. Yeah, no, that is awesome. I, um, I, guys, I have to apologize to you. Um, me and Fred, we tried to, as soon as the new bow was released, we tried to nail down some times, uh, to record and, and just talk about the new bow. And, uh, when I know, uh, when we talked about the new compounds, uh, I had mentioned Fred was going to come on and talk about the new, uh, recurve. And then our schedules just didn't allow for it. I had some traveling to do. He had some traveling to do and, uh, they just didn't line up. And so we're finally getting around to it, but, better late than never. I'm excited to talk about the new Fred Eichler signature series. Uh, so Fred, before we dump, jump into the whole, the whole process of, of what you wanted out of this bow, uh, give us the details on the Fred Eichler signature series. You know, it, it's, it's a pretty sweet bow and I, I can get into all kinds of stuff. I, and I say, I worked with it to me. It was a project I did with Fred bear, <laughs> which is kind of neat. Yeah, That's um, really cool. You know, Fred, Fred's been gone a while, but uh, I liked, uh, I got to meet him a few times and he had a big influence on, on my life, like a lot of people's lives, you know, reading his books and watching his videos. So even when I'm hunting with that bow now, it's like, wow, this is a project I, I worked with Fred Bear on. And, and to me, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of neat. But uh, some of the things about the bow, we set it up to where 
you can go from 58 inches to 62 inches, you know, whether you use the number one, number two, or number three lambs. We also wanted it to be, uh, you know, we wanted everybody to be able to get, you know, whatever they wanted out of the bow. If you wanted a light bow, you know, you know, with a, with, you know, a longer length bow, you could do that. If you wanted a shorter bow, heavier, lighter poundage, you could do that. So, you know, I think our weight ranges right now are from, uh, I think 30 pounds, depending on what limbs you go with all the way up to like 70 or 75 pounds on the different limb variations. Uh, the riser is 17 inches long. I suppose that's what you wanted was the stats on it. Um, yeah. and then, uh, you know, one of the other things that I always struggled with, uh, with my bare bows, cause, uh, one of my first recurves and the, you know, that, that, I, that I ever shot was a bear recurve. And I also worked at bear archery. Some people know that, but that, that flat shelf was always difficult for me to get perfect arrow flight out of, uh, you know, on the bears. And, you know, a lot of the old timers, uh, you know, Fred bear and some of the other guys would do things to try and get that arrow off that flat shelf. Um, they would put toothpicks or pieces of wood or nails and things like that. And I was doing the same thing with my bare bows. Um, you know, when I was shooting off the shelf to try and get perfect arrow flight. So I wanted to just take that out of the equation and, and do some other cool stuff. So, so that's what we did. I added, uh, there's another set of screws to the side plate. Um, Fred's original design was amazing. Not only the takedown, you know, the no tools takedown, but also, uh, the side plate that, you know, would adjust when you shot. Well, my problem was, um, that thin metal would sometimes you could get brushed behind it. You could, you know, it would react differently like metal does when it's super hot or whether it's super cold. Um, so I wanted to be able to set that once I got that side plate, right. I wanted to be able to set it in a lock position. So we had another set screw. So that side plate, you could lock it in wherever you wanted it. Um, once you got center shot and a perfect arrow. Um, the other thing is I really wanted to bevel the, uh, you know, the shelf. So you would have better clearance or less contact on your arrow. So, but it's not a one size fits all. Uh, what we decided to do is, is go with different, um, different variations, um, of the bevel, if you will, that you can just screw in and screw out with a Allen wrench, um, with a little key and run it in or run it out, put on different sizes until it fits you perfectly. You know, and also some guys are shooting three fingers under some people shoot, you know, Mediterranean style or split finger like I do. So we wanted it to be able to work for not only everybody, uh, but we also want to be, be able to shoot from the shelf, different lengths, different poundages. Uh, but also, even if you want to do, uh, you know, put an elevated rest, let's say you're, you know, you want to use pins or you want to, for some reason, you like an elevated rest, you could do that. Uh, but to be honest, still, that, that between you and me, I designed it for me, man. <laughs> I, designed it, I designed it for me. I, I, I mean, I'd be fibbing if I said, you know, I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. We wanted everybody to be able to shoot this bow and enjoy it. But it was like, man, what's the perfect bow to me? So that's what I kind of yeah. kept in mind the whole way through. And, you know, of course, as you know, you know, Jonathan, the president over there, you know, or the GM, he's, he's a super sharp guy. He's got a lot of design ideas and, you know, the engineers, it was really a fun project. But the fact that, you know, I kept Fred Bear in my mind the whole time was just a cool part of it. So two, two questions I have for you. Um, one being on that shelf, why would anybody want more contact? Like in my mind, everybody would jump straight to the, so, so the interchangeable plates is, is what I'm talking about uh, for those that are listening. Seems like everybody would jump right to the plate with the least amount of contact. That way that arrow is less affected by things. So why would somebody want more contact on that shelf? Why would they go with one of those inserts that have more contact? Well, they're varying degrees, and that's a great question, but a lot of it depends, believe it or not. You know, Archer's Paradox is funny, um, and I know you know what it is, but, you know, Archer's Paradox is the arrow flexing. So your arrow, when you shoot, you know what I mean? It flexes and then goes forward. Um, there's so many things that will make variables on how that arrow comes off the shelf and off the, you know, off the not only the, the shelf, but off the side of the riser. Um, the amount of pressure you put on different fingers the size arrow, you know, the diameter arrow you're using, of course, the spine of the arrow, um, how much torque you put on the string. You know, I, I've told guys to draw your recurve. A lot of people think, you know, oh man, I've, I've got perfect, you know, I've got perfect form. I'm like, well, I said, if you ever think you have perfect form, just draw your recurve or longbow in the mirror and draw back and take a look. And, and what you'll see is that arrow comes down and then, it, or your string comes down. And then depending on how much pressure you're putting, it may go out to an angle 
and then go back down and comes down to the, you know, to your bottom limb. So that's a neat way of looking at your form. I have terrible form. I, you know what, man, I watch, I drop that bow after I shoot, you know, sometimes I push my hand too far away, but I try and do the same thing every time. So it's a long winded answer to your question, but there are different things that will work for different people because we all shoot a bow differently. Um, the way I release is different than the way you release. The way Fred Bear released was different than the way, you know, uh, other people release. So I've never really seen anybody. It's very rare where people shoot the exact same, you know, uh, you know, the height of your elbow, you know, like I said, the percentage that you're putting on each finger, whether you're shooting three fingers under. So some people find that a little bit more contact, less contact, a little higher, a little lower uh, will work better for them. Uh, same thing with, you know, fletching. Um, it used to be the old rule was, you know, cock feather out, you know, and you had a cock feather, or two hen feathers, you had three feathers basically. And then a lot of people went to four feathers and, you know, if you look some of the old pictures I have of me with, you know, animals, I went with four feathers because I went, wow, it'll stabilize the broadhead quicker. And when I managed the archery shop, I would convince guys like, Ooh, do this. That's great. But it also slows it down. And then sometimes you can get more contact on the shelf. So you know, rotating your knock, turning those fletches to find out, you know, with your setup, what's going to work the best. Um, you know, sometimes I'll run cock feather in, sometimes I'll run cock feather straight up. Um, but by shooting through paper and shooting bare shafts, you can, you can tune in it. I'm sorry, Dylan, I get excited when I start talking about recurves and I blab oh, on, but that, there's that's your, why you're your long winded answer to your question that, that should have been a lot shorter. I had one guy, um, Cause I think you had said in a, in a recent post or maybe in a video or something that you had designed this bow for you. Um, and I heard one guy say, well, that's kind of, you know, why would it, why would it be just for Fred? And I'm like, well, if it was going to be designed for somebody, why not it be one of the guys who understands this more than anybody who's, who's found more success than maybe anybody else with a recurve in their life. So, um, I, I like the fact I find solace in the fact that it was designed for you. Uh, because I'm like, Hey, if it's good for Fred, it's good for me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Fred, I think, you know, I, I, I probably coined that a little bit from Fred bear because when Fred bear designed to bow, Fred bear designed it for him to be more yeah. efficient. And that's, and, and that's really what, you know, the, the way I've applied stuff, you know, I think I, I do it and go, how, how can I utilize this more efficiently? And then, of course, if I can utilize it more efficiently, then I think most people can utilize it more efficiently as well. Right. And we did some of the other cool stuff, if you don't mind me jumping into it. Like, you know, Bear Archery has – Fred Bear was left-handed, but they haven't made a left-handed in that takedown riser since the 70s. You know what I mean? Even when they came out right. with the new back riser, it wasn't available left-handed. So, you know, we talked about it, and I was like, you know, kind of out of respect for Fred Bear and all the lefties out there, we need to offer this in left-handed as well. And yeah, the tooling is going to cost more money. And a lot of the things that I did honestly cost more money. There were a lot of things uh, that we could have done a lot cheaper uh, that would have required a lot less tooling, a lot less machining. Um, that riser, for example, is lighter than the other risers. You know what I mean? Any of the other. I was going to get into that, the cutouts. Oh, okay. Great. Well, I'll let you ask, but it, there was a lot of little things that I wanted to do. And some of them added cost. And, and you know, it was... It was really neat, and I really appreciated, you know, Jonathan and, and the engineers I worked with because they were all, you know, Tim, th those guys were all on track with, you know what, yeah, let's let's make it great. And if it's going to cost a little more or we're going to have to run it through another machine to tool it this way, then then let's, you know, let's, let's not do it and wish we had. Let's just do it. How long did you play with the – that's the, the first thing I noticed when I saw this bow – um, was the cutouts if you've seen or even shot the the mag riser uh, it's one kind of just solid piece of aluminum uh, and then you see the the fred eichler signature series and there's a lot of cutouts there's a lot of riser that's not there um so did you start with like hey, hey i want a lot of cutouts take as much out as you can or, or did that kind of evolve over time into more and more cutouts you know great question and and a lot of it evolved over time um and me shooting it and that's a great thing we weren't in a rush. I mean, we, we spent over a year working on this prototype and there was a lot of, you know, me on the grinder, you know, in the, in the barn, you know, literally grinding stuff down and slow motion yeah. video and 
you know, I did a lot of things where, you know, I would get a prototype and I would shoot it. I think that was our fourth. We had, of course, the CAD, you know what I mean, prototype. And uh, I managed to break that pretty quickly because it was not a working model. It was just a CAD, you know what I mean, carbon right. type one. I was messing with it. I, <laughs> I broke it in half right off the bat. But, uh, you know, then when I first got the first rough one, I just made all kinds of changes. Like the shelf was way too wide. Nobody's shooting. I mean, the biggest arrow somebody's shooting right now would be, you know, a 2360 force wooden arrow. You know what I mean? Most guys are shooting 11 30 seconds or 5 16. A lot of guys are shooting, you know, you know, or the carbon or, you know, the aluminums, you know, or whatever brand carbon you like. But, you know, there was no reason to have a shelf that was three quarters of an inch wide when none of the arrows are wide. So, you know, I, I, that just gives you more things for the feather to contact. So I literally wanted that arrow to be sitting on there comfortably stable, but I didn't want anything extra. So, you know, I ground down a lot of stuff and, and then I would say, okay, you know, what do you think of this? You know, and this is what I'm getting. And I'd shoot it through paper and I'd bear shaft shoot it and I'd take it hunting. And then I'd go, man, you know, I wedged some brush underneath this or, you know, my side plate reacted differently when I was hunting in zero degree weather you know, versus a hundred really? So you know, do you let's, think that is? Let's, well, it's, it's just, it's material. So like anything like uh, there's plastics and metal, you know, metal artists that could give you a lot more information on it, but you know, plastic springs, you know, light, light aluminum or steel and things like that. Um, especially on that side plate will react differently. You know what I mean? If it's super cold versus super hot, um, you know, it just wasn't flexing as much or it would flex more. So I wanted to be able to lock that in position. I never wanted to change. Or if I stuck a piece of brush in, I mean, I'm bad about sometimes I'm going through and dragging my bus, my boat through things or crossing a river, or, you know what I mean? Dropping it, you know, all kinds of stuff. I didn't want that side plate to get bent or change positions over time. I wanted to have another set screw to where once I got it set up, that it was going to stay right there. But if guys didn't want it, they could take it out or they could go with an elevated dress. You know, everything I did was set up more for, you know, shooting off the shelf and, and hunting. But we also wanted the option for the guys that want a serious target shoot or don't want to shoot off the shelf or like an elevated rest. Um, so they could, you know, they could utilize it as well, whether they're com com competing or doing whatever they want to do with the bow. So if you wanted to shoot an elevated rest, you would have to take off the strike plate. Um, no. Well, yes, you'd have to take off the strike plate and run it right through the threaded hole. That's correct. But what if you wanted to shoot like a, like a bare weather rest, would you just stick it to the strike plate? Yeah, you could still shoot a bare weather rest and you could put it right on there and you could push it in tighter or you could roll it out too. But uh, you know, man, the bare weather rest, uh, to me, that's, you know, that's an okay rest, but I, I, I think the elevated or going on the shelf is a little better way to go. Personally. So if, if somebody did want to shoot an elevated rest, what would you suggest? That's a question I get a lot. Yeah, there's, you know what? And again, there's not one fix. And I, I think a lot of guys try and do that. And, you know, Dylan, where, where guys are like, well, what's the one best rest? Well, what are you going to be doing with it? Are you target shooting? Or are you hunting? What size arrow are you shooting? Um, you know, are you going to, are you going for quiet? Are you going for super consistent? Are you going for, you know, so there's, and, and I like the fact that there's tons of rests out there, just like there's tons of trucks, you know what I mean? I'll have a guy go, you know, Oh man, this truck's great for me. And I'm like, Oh, that truck doesn't work for me because it's way too fancy yeah. inside. I'm going to trash it. Or so to me, durable and tough, you know, but consistent, accurate, you know, tunable, those are some of the things that I really look for. So it's a great question on the rest. I'm not ignoring your question. I'm saying there's just a lot of variables. There's a lot of different bear options, um, you know, as far as rest and other company options as well. And I tell guys, try them all, you know what I mean? Just like, just like with bows. I mean, if, if this bow's not shooting great for you, get another bow. I mean, I want everybody to, to, to have the most successful hunt they can. And don't think that just because, XYZ works for me that XYZ will, will, will work for you. Um, there may be a lot of features about it that will, but I want everybody to have the best setup. I mean, I guess, you know, Fred had the best attitude about a lot of that. It was, he wasn't trying to turn everybody into a bow hunter. It was trying to turn everybody into a bow hunter and, and Fred bear, yeah. you know, he, he didn't really, 
he was a businessman. Don't get me wrong. You know, he, he had a business, but he also, he wanted to grow the sport. And I love that about, you know, Fred bear. It was more about making more bow hunters than it was. You just have to shoot a bear archery bow, you know, and, and, I love that. and I've tried to adapt some of that stuff. So, you know, man, a great question, but there's all kinds of rest, you know, try, try them and see what works best for your individual style. Which is exactly why I love the company of bear archery. Um, you know, a lot of companies don't make recurves. A lot of companies don't make crossbows. A lot of, you know, your, your super or high end bow. crossbows. Yeah. Or longbows. A lot of your super high end crossbows don't make any compounds or any, or any recurves or long, but you know what I mean? Most companies are one track minded. Um, even some of your bigger bow companies are one track minded, but bear archery makes something for everyone and they don't leave anybody out. And that's what I absolutely love. And I wish not only more companies would, would adapt that mindset. I just wish more hunters would adapt that mindset. Like I could care less what you shoot or how you shoot it or why you shoot it. I don't care if you shoot a longbow, uh, self bow recurve. I don't care if you shoot a, a compound. I don't even care if you shoot a crossbow. All I care is that you get out and enjoy the sport of, of archery hunting. Um, and, and that's at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. And, and, you know, for me, that is, that was part of the switch to a recurve was, you know, I just lost the joy of, of tinkering and messing with archery stuff and, and, you know, switching to traditional equipment gave me that, that, that joy back of just going out to the, the shop and tinkering with different stuff and trying different stuff and, you know, playing with, with, broadhead weights and and different fletchings and i mean that kind of stuff is is what i enjoy and so uh at the same time i tell people not to get caught up in all the in all the you know different equipment like just shoot what you want to shoot and what you enjoy but on the on the opposite end of the spectrum of that like try everything and then find what you like the most. So, you know, don't just say, well, this is what Fred shoots or this is what Dylan shoots, or, uh, this is what the hunting public shoots, you know, find something that you enjoy shooting and shoot that bow. And that's what, that's what you should shoot. Uh, and the same goes for arrows or, or dude, I, by the way, um, they sent me some of your carbon legacies, gorgeous arrows, <laughs> Not gorgeous. Cool. I told Gary, I said, uh, I said, yeah, dude, I'm actually just ordered my Fred Eichler signature series. And he said, well, if that's what you're going to be shooting, then you got to have your, the Fred Eichler name on your arrows too. So, uh, I just got some of those in, um, right before Thanksgiving, just three days ago. So I'm excited to try some out, man. Man. And you know, we did so much with that arrow too. And that's, what's fun for me is having the opportunity to play with stuff. You know, I, you know, I like tinkering and I, I mess with my equipment like a lot of guys, but you know, even like you said on the arrow side um you know for guys that wanted to string walk or guys that wanted to tune that arrow perfectly you know we we brought it back to the really you know the full length arrow so guys could cut it off and tune it perfectly and you know we offered lighter spines all the way out to a 700 spine so you know it's a perfect arrow for you know women kids or lighter poundage works great with you know recurves longbows compounds i mean it, it literally that arrow was designed for everything but of course, with the traditional shooter in mind, but we did a lot of cool stuff with that, uh, with that and it's arrow. It's just sexy. It's just a sexy arrow. Like, that is, that is it's a good, good looking. looking arrow. Yeah. That's good a Gary said the same thing. He said, I think, I think this may be the most attractive arrow we've ever had, which is that's exactly is what he said. Cool. That's exactly what he said. We were, we were, we were on a conference call, uh, and, uh, for Pope and young. And we asked him, what's your favorite arrow ever made? And, uh, he, I don't even remember what he said, but, uh, then he said, as far as looks go, like, as far as aesthetically a pleasing arrow, like the, the new carbon legacy. And I'm like, huh, very cool. Yeah, <laughs> speaking of, speaking of good looking bows or, or good looking equipment, if you have not seen the Fred Eichler signature series bow, gorgeous bow, I absolutely love the cutouts. I think it looks fantastic. I think that tan color is just to die for. I think it's a good looking bow, man. I, I, I really applaud both you and Bear Archery all around for that. Well, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. It was neat. It was uh, you know, it was fun. The whole project for me, you know, Fred Bear, and I've I've written about that a lot and talked about it. You know, I still have my Bear Archery badge for what I worked at Bear Archery because it was so neat to me since That's I grew cool. up. Fred Bear's field notes and watching his videos and the TV show, you know, when he was on, you know, when he was on TV, you know, when Kurt Gowdy was narrating some of that, but to work on 
Fred's original design, which is what that was. I mean, Fred designed that latch system, that, that, yeah. you know, tools takedown. It was really neat. And to be in the field, like for me to be in the field with that bow, like I like to think, and I know it's, you know, probably a little superstitious, but I like to think Fred bears there, you know, it's just neat. And it, you know, it, that's my own uh, little thing. I like to think he's, uh, he's there with me and I just have a good time with it. So it was really neat. I, you know, people that some people don't even know, or, you know, the guys that aren't super into the whole archery thing, you know, when somebody get comments about it, I'm like, yeah, it's a project I did with Fred bear. You know, they may not even know that, you know, cool. Fred's been gone a long time ago. That was Fred's original design. But, you know, to me, that's always, you know, my, my, uh, humble, small, you know, things that I did to it, you know, it was Fred's design. It's like, you know, it's like saying, I, you know, I changed, I changed the wheels on a Ford truck. You know what I mean? You didn't design the Ford truck. Right. You know, I, I just had a, a small, humble contribution that, that wasn't rocket science, but, but it was things that, you know, I, I think bear, it was time for them to, to take that bow to the next level, you know, not only, you know, have a bow that besides having the name bear archery on it was on par with anything out there. And again, it's, it's like a custom bow that's manufactured. I mean, that's, that's, that's really kind of what you're getting there. It's exactly what I, I uh, just recently had a friend reach out and he said, Hey, what, which bow should I go with? And I said, well, dude, that's a loaded question, man. I said, most, yeah, most, right. most bought and, and, you know, highest sold bow as far as numbers go is the Grizzly. I said, but if you're wanting to, you know, take that next step and get more of a custom made recurve, I said, then you're going to have to go with, you know, the, the Fred Eichler signature series or the Fred bear takedown, you know, one of those bows are going to be as high quality as a custom takedown that you would buy and spend frankly a whole lot more money on. Um, just I'm so everybody knows pounds, even speed wise, that's, what's fun. I'm my bow's 45 pounds that I'm shooting. And, you know, like I said, I've killed two elk, caribou, deer. I mean, I blew through that mule deer the other day on video, 33 yards, 45-pound recurve. You know, That's people incredible. think – What kind of speed are you getting out of it? So many people overbow themselves. It's crazy. Um, I think I'm averaging 183 or 185 wow. people a second right in there. But my arrow's flying like a dart, and that's the whole thing. You know, when people have that arrow, yeah. you know, they kick 100%. in and they hit – it doesn't matter if you're shooting 70 pounds, you're, you don't have that energy. You know, it's not, it's not going like this 100%. And getting the penetration and the energy it's depleting cause it's, it's hitting sideways. But when you've got everything dialed and tuned up and I tell guys, that's the most important thing, no matter what recurve or longbow or compound you're shooting, spend the extra time learning how to tune it. And it will, you can go lighter poundage, get better performance, better penetration, more accuracy, there's, it's a, there's a million things that'll do. Well, I had somebody asking me about the importance of tuning a bow and, and how far of, of a tune you should go into. And this is the, and you alluded to it, but I told him, I said, just take a piece of paper and a pencil and try to stab it straight through and it'll go through. But if you try to stab it in like that, you're just going to push to the side or push down or you, you might get a little hole, but uh, you're not going to, you know, punch through it. But if you go straight through, you know, you'll, you'll make a hole. Um, and so that, that's the definition of tuning an arrow. You want that arrow to hit them perfectly straight going into them. That way you get the most penetration you can possibly get. Uh, and that's the main difference. Um, just so everybody knows, and, and I know Fred is a good friend of, of three rivers. Um, go over to three rivers, archery.com and check out the Fred Eichler signature series. You can get the riser. You can get limbs. You can get all the accessories you need for it. You can get all the arrows you need for it. You can order all the rest you would ever want to try for it. Three rivers is your largest in stock selection of traditional archery equipment in the United States. A lot of things they offer same day shipping on. They are excellent at giving you information. So if you are just, you're wondering, what should I shoot? Why should I shoot it? How should I shoot it? Call those guys. Just ask them. Uh, they are fantastic about giving out information. They're good friends of mine, good friends of Bear Archery's, good friends of Fred's. Um, so go check out the Fred Eichler Signature Series at threeriversarchery.com. Uh, you you <clears throat> brought up a good point. Those guys are all hardcore. They're hardcore traditional guys over there and women. And that, yeah. that's what's to me. I mean, the, you know, I've, I've guided, you know, those guys, you know, Jonathan Dale been out hunting with me. Uh, they both killed, you know, mule deer with me, made great shots. You know, we got to shoot longbows and recurves together. And that's what, you know, brought about the signature tab. I worked with those guys on, but you brought up a great point. They, they can answer any question. It's not like calling somewhere and going, Hey, 
I get a question about this and you get somebody that doesn't know the three rivers guys know, but they're also because they actually use the equipment. Important. They know, the, sorry, equipment. they know the equipment because they use the equipment, right? Cause they shoot it and then, and they design those. Those guys are just, they're yeah. good with anything, but they're also one of the few places right now I know that are taking back orders. Cause I know if you go, a buddy of mine just tried to buy my bow the other day and he said, man, bear archery, everything shows up as, as back order. They're not taking orders, but three rivers is actually taking orders, even if they are back ordered. So you get a slot in the line. So that's kind of yeah. a nice thing to know as well. Yeah. Those guys are, are fantastic. I remember when I first switched, when I first started tinkering with recurves, I just called Jonathan. I'm like, dude, this is the bow I got. I have no idea where to even start. You know, I shoot a 250 spine arrow on my compound. I, I don't have any idea where to even start with my recurve. And he said, what, what bow is it? You know, um, what's your poundage, what's your draw length, what's your poundage at your draw length. And I gave him all that information. He said, all right, you need a 500 spine at 28 inches, uh, 29 inches with 150 gram broadhead. And I'm like, <laughs> sure. All right. And you know, he sent, well, me some, sent me some arrows and flew like darts. And I'm like, Holy cow, Jonathan, like you are, you're a wizard. Yeah. And him and his dad are both great shots. Like I said, we've had great times. They made great shots on mule deer out here with me in Colorado. I actually shot uh, a doe with them out there in Indiana. I think two deer actually. Yeah. I shot two deer out there with them. You know, they're, they're just super guys. And uh, I think a lot of their whole family. When, what is, uh, I know you, you kind of talked about 45 pounds, uh, but what is your setup on this, on this recurve from start to finish? What, what are you shooting on your own bow? No, great, great question. So, uh, you know, I'm shooting off the shelf, so I'm just shooting, uh, you know, moleskin on the, on the, uh, on the shelf itself. Um, right now, the only thing I've done is I've got some moleskin on the limb tips. Um, I don't have any you know, brush buttons. I don't have any silencers on there. I don't have anything on there at all. Um, but I did, you know, adjust it up. I'm shooting eight and a half, um, or, you know, eight and four, eight, same thing is, is the brace height that came out perfect for me. Uh, but I've got it set up at 62 inches and it's flying like a dart. It's 45 pound limbs. Uh, so at my draw, that's coming out at about 48, I should say. So it's a little, little heavier. Uh, but, uh, let's see, I'm shooting the, uh, the 500, uh, legacies out of that. And I'm shooting 145 grain muzzy. So I've got a little FOC, you know, got a little front of center weight on that. Um, and man, it's just shooting perfect bullet holes. I did a video, you know, where I wanted people to watch from behind and, you know, you know, shoot it. And we did a YouTube video on, you know, me tuning that up and shooting actually some different spined arrows to show that, there's not just one you can go with this and different point weight and this and, you know, change it around. And again, that goes back to what you want. You know, I've had people say, you know, what's the perfect, you know, what's the perfect arrow setup? And I'm like, well, do you just shoot targets or do you want to shoot targets? Do you want to, you know, shoot a deer? Do you want to, you know, you know, do you want to shoot bigger game elk? You know, there, there's so many variables again there, you know, flatter trajectory might be advantageous if you're just target shooting. Um, you know, a little heavier arrow, it's going to be advantageous if you're going to shoot a lot of big game, but you know, I shoot what a lot of people would say is, you know, and I love this, but the experts, most of them haven't shot much, but you know, oh, that's way too light. And I'm like, well, you know, there's, there's, there's almost 30 elk that would argue with you. Um, but, <laughs> um, I, you know, the two elk I shot this year, uh, to give you an example, one, and, and, and again, I'm, I'm not advocating a longer shot. If I had known it was this far, I honestly, uh, Dylan, I probably wouldn't have shot the elk to be honest with you, but, um, I just saw the elk and knew I could make the shot in Oregon this year. Uh, that one ended up being 39 yards. Um, I shot and, uh, I hit near the last trip. The arrow went all the way through and the video is neat because when the bull turns, you can actually see my muzzy coming out about four inches. That's cool right in the pocket on the other side. So, I mean, you know, that's with a 48 pound recurve or 45 pound limbs, what I was shooting. But again, I had a perfectly tuned arrow, you know, and then I came home and shot a, uh, an elk. And I think that one, I might have to watch the video, but I think it was 24 yards, something like that. And, uh, it was, uh, it was quartering to a little bit. I had to put it tight right against the shoulder. Um, and it went in about three quarters of the way and that bull made it 37 yards. I think it was when we ranged it and dropped. 
So, you know, I, you know, how dead is too dead, you know, caribou. I shot through the edge of the scapula that was at 20, I think it was almost exactly 25 yards through the edge of the scapula went through both lung, lungs, hit the opposite side bull ran out there. I didn't range how far it ran to be honest, but I would, if I was to guess it, I would say hundred, 150 yards and flipped over stone dead. So, you know, I, I pick my shots, I choose my shots. Um, but you really, so many guys overbow themselves with traditional equipment that, uh, it's, it, I really, I, I think there was one thing I would tell people was, you know, with the speeds, the arrows that we have, the small carbon arrows, um, the technology and, 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 and broadheads, you know, shooting a 45 pound limbs, you know, like, you know, let's, let's take that bear, for example, shooting a 45 pound limb today with the newer equipment and the speeds we're getting and the better penetration we're getting with carbon arrows is probably equivalent to shooting close to a 55 pound bow was years ago. So, you know, I, I, I really think there's, there's so many advantages, you know, so you read a lot about, you know, you know, guys shooting super heavy and, you know, I, there's no need to, in my opinion. How long for that 500 spine to tune out? How long is that arrow cut to? Um, I'm shooting just under 30 inches for the spine to be exactly where I want it. Gotcha. So, so I choose to shoot a 400 spine so I can keep it close to full length. Um, reason being, I, I, I tell guys this all the time. I shoot point on. Um, so, so I reference the point of my arrow when I shoot, uh, for those of you who don't know what that means. Uh, and the longer that arrow is, the shorter your point on is going to be. So for instance, if I shoot a 32 inch arrow, my point on might be 35 yards. If I shoot a 28 and a half inch arrow, my point on might be 45 yards. Um, so I keep that full length. Um, that way I don't have a point on of 60 yards or, or whatever it would turn out to be if I cut it all the way down. So, um, I, I shoot a 400 spine and leave it a lot longer. Um, that way I can, I can, uh, reference that point. I, I'm not a strict point on shooter. Um, I, but I do reference that point kind of out of my peripherals when I'm shooting. So, um, that, that, that's what I choose to do. Is that difficult to do? I, the only thing I, I wonder, or, or I, I've never done that, but Broadheads are a lot longer in most cases than field points. So I would think, does it change from a field point to a broadhead if you're referencing the point? Like, I think that would um, kind of be up because if you're talking a different, you know, an inch longer on the tip of a broadhead versus a field so, point, I, I don't know, maybe that works out. So, so again, I am not a strict point on shooter. It might be different for, for strict point on shooters. You know, you talk to some guys and they're like, what, 24 yards, I need to be eight inches low. Uh, I I don't shoot that strict of point on. So, for instance, like if I'm shooting a deer at 20 yards, I look at where I want to hit. I don't I don't I ever look at the point of my arrow. <clears throat> I can just kind of reference, okay, I see the point of my arrow right at his feet. So I know I'm somewhere in there. Now, once I get to you know, 35, 36 yards, then my point is just right underneath it. So I reference that a lot more. Um, but I also, and, and I think I've heard you talk about this, you know, from August on, I don't ever shoot field points. I, right. I just shoot, I just shoot my broadheads and, and don't worry about it. Uh, really the only time I'm shooting field points is the, the tuning of the arrow before I ever, uh, you know, get the setup I want to shoot. And so, um, you know, probably a good question. I mean, yeah, it definitely could change it. I'm sure. But I just don't, I'm not a strict point on shooter. So I'm not looking at, you know, okay, I need to be seven inches low because I'm at 18 wow. yards. Um, and, and there are those guys, you know, I've seen guys, you know, who carry around literally a, a little flip notepad in their pocket and they can look and say, okay, at 23 yards, I need to be seven and a half inches below. And I'm like, dude, what? Now you're way overthinking this. Like, <laughs> so, so <laughs> yeah, if math starts coming into it, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> yeah. What is, uh, what's your, what's your quiver on that bow? You know, I mean, I'm using that. Uh, Chris Brito does that. It's the, uh, uh I love the grayling it. Grayling quiver from Selway. It's, 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 it's awesome, man. Chris Perino helped design that. I think he had an involvement in that and they've got, they're, uh, they're awesome. I use it as a four arrow, even though it's technically a five arrow and I'm trying to get in the habit of putting five in there because a lot of times I like shooting at squirrels and stuff, but I've just carried four oh, yeah. arrows for so long, but I, man, it's quiet. You just screw it right into the riser and they've got different colors and they've just come a long ways with, with those new, you know, those newer Selway quivers and, and the ones that just screw yeah. on, they're just slick, man. And, and my buddy, Chris, he's, 
he shot elk with me, lion with me, turkeys with me. Chris is one of the greatest guys me. ever. He, I he, love that guy. Uh, I, we've literally, we probably shot seven or eight species. He came out here hunting with me and shot a lot of animals with me over the years. So I like, uh, I like the heck out of Chris. He's a good guy. I actually heard somebody one time, um, they said something about Chris Perino and they said, yeah, they kill, he kills more stuff than anybody, uh, without the last name Eichler. <laughs> That's what they said. <laughs> yeah. Chris is a hunter, man. He's, he is, he always has been, he's, uh, you know, I've watched him slip up on elk and, and make some great shots and, you know, turkeys. And we've had a great time hunting together on some stuff. So yeah, Chris is a good, good, good friend. And, you know, I, I think he's had a little involvement on some of that Selway stuff too. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's neat working with him and, and Selway's just been a great company for a long time. The fact that they're doing some really cool stuff with the bear stuff is awesome. Oh yeah, man. I, I, I love Selway. And then, uh, Chris sent me one of the prototypes of that grayling and I'm just like, yes, this is awesome. Uh, that and it's different colors that, like camo. And uh, tan yeah. And well, tan. well, let me just tell you, if you get that tan riser on the Fred Eichler signature series, a Fred bear camo grayling looks really good on it. So I can tell you that. <laughs> nice. Nice. No, I, I, uh, walked by Chris at, at, uh, ATA, they bear had just released their new razor head and I walked by Chris and buddy, he held that, that, broadhead up for 30 minutes looking at every angle of that broadhead and i walked by him and i said yeah that won't work for you bud <laughs> and he said shut up <laughs> that's great yeah chris is a tweaker man he'd always he's always tweaking stuff and but you know he's he's funny he's a he's a good dude I, yeah i like this phenomenal guy no i uh i i also i referenced back last time you were on the show you told me about uh you and chuck adams uh poker game yes uh, just so everybody knows, uh, Pope and Young currently right now is doing a raffle. You can win a whitetail hunt in Oklahoma with Chuck Adams uh, and myself. I'll be there with him, uh, and we're going to hunt, and we're going to have a good time. And I told Chuck, I said, hey, Chuck, listen, uh, we're going to have to play poker because I hear you're easy to beat. He said, shut up, man. Oh, said, shut I bet he lost up. his mind. He said, shut up, dude. He said, Fred cheated. <laughs> <laughs> I am not cheating. Now he thinks me drawing my straight on the river, or actually my full house on the river is cheating. But we had both got all in after thirteen and a half hours straight. So yeah, you'll have to ask him about that game. It was something yeah. else. Yeah, I Chuck said a competitor. Uh, He's a competitor. Actually, he, I was pulling out a lion that I shot um, this year. It was the first day of the year, January first. It was so neat. I shot this lion, and. Uh, with the, with that brand new, I was, uh, I was messing with some prototype stuff and, uh, shot it and was carrying it out over my shoulders and my phone's ringing. And, you know, you're like, what the heck, who's calling? And you know, I'm, I'm like wondering if it's the boys or something's going on with the farm or, and I grabbed the phone. It was Chuck. It was kind of cool. I was like, Chuck. So I picked it up. It was kind of neat. He's that a good cool. guy. Very cool. Um, yeah. So I told him, I said, man, I can't wait to play poker with you. I said, cause I hear you're just an easy win. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. Just say, just that'll worry about it. And say, yeah, Fred said he's Fred brags about taking your money. Yeah, I certainly will. Um, what's, what's next for you? What, what do you got next on the, on the bucket list for this year? Man, I'm just not stopping, buddy. I'm just having such a great year. I'm going to keep rolling. Uh, you know, like I said, yesterday was Thanksgiving. I was guiding, uh, some hunters had two guys out. They both filled actually, I was late for Thanksgiving dinner really late because uh guy shot the bull like 14 minutes before legal light ended so i had to get that out of there uh last night and then we finished skinning him this morning um but man you know i have so much fun interacting with animals that i'm having a blast you know during the rut i got some more clients i'm guiding my son still got a tag but me and the oldest jeb went out the other day and uh he was shooting his bear and uh i think he's shooting a legacy if i remember right but which one, which bear? Redemption. The redemption. Yeah. Jeb, Jeb shooting the redemption. Um, but Jeb had his bear compound. I had my recur. We were only 800 yards apart. I had a Montana decoy, uh, prototype mule deer, uh, that I'm using and, uh, that, that isn't even on the market yet. We were trying to see how mule deer were going to react to it. Jeb was about 800 yards from me and he had a, a white tail, uh, decoy in front of him. And, he has a white. Is it one of the, up. one of the 2d pop-up 2d pop-up yeah, the two D Montana decoy pop-up. Yeah. So Jeb, Jeb had a white tail buck go all the way across the field, right up to it, like five yards. He shoots it. He texts me. He's like, I just got a deer 
I'm like, that's awesome. I'll be there in a minute. I got a big whitetail buck looking at mine or a big muley buck looking at mine. This mule deer buck comes up at about 33 yards as he's coming to the decoy. He sees another buck turn sideways. And again, I, I didn't range it till afterwards, but uh, the video is so sweet. But I drew back and just had Errol just and uh, took off the top of his heart. He ran out there and dropped right behind the decoy. So we got two beautiful deer. So I, I, I'm just going to keep, man, I've got another, I got a whitetail tag here. I got a tag in New Mexico. Lion season starts in two days. Um, so I've got some more tags here that I'm going to be playing with heading to New Mexico. Um, and then a lot of predator stuff. So I'm just going to keep after it. So you, you're talking one of these, right? It's the doe. Uh, I was using a buck that's not even out yet. It's a, it's a mule deer decoy. It's a prototype. Jeb was using the white tail with the realistic tail, but it's the, uh, it's the doe. So I, I don't know why I didn't think to ask you a long time ago, because I know you have uh history with Montana decoy. Um, but my, my dad gifted me uh, a couple Christmases ago. Oh, look at that right there. Um, no. A couple Christmases ago, gifted me with a a buck and a doe decoy, oh, uh, wh white tails. And to tell you the truth, man, I've been kind of scared to use them. I, I I don't I don't want that to sound bad by any way, but I'm just like, man, if a deer sees this, I'm trying to find the the ones I have, but um, and I don't know which buck and which doe. My it son is. just used the estrus Betty the other day. Um, this one here. But, uh, it's it's awesome. Trixie is is one I love too. But we have it, it's the rut right now, and you know Michelle shot a monster whitetail that ran up was literally going to her decoy after she had three or four other bucks go right up to it. Now we put a little conquest scent on it. You know we put some BS one, so not only does it look good, but it smells good. But I'm gonna tell you, during the right time of year, and and it's like anything, it doesn't work all the time. But during the rut, I've had unbelievable luck with decoys. Un unbelievable. Like it is, they will I run love the field and run up to it. And we've shot three deer, like right in front of the decoys. Mine was the furthest and it was 33 yards, which means it was only 20 yards or 22 yards from the, from where I had the decoy, but man, they work awesome. I believe this set is probably the one that I have, uh, the dream team. Um, it's, uh, it's exciting. You've got to stay on point though. I'm telling you, it's not, if, especially in thick brush. I don't have as much luck. Um, again, it, it takes the right scenario, but you know, we're hunting some open fields, some sage, uh, ag fields where right now, both the whitetail and the mule deer are cruising, you know, they're looking for does yeah, and you know, it is a buck will come out, and he'll look and see if there's any does in the field. And if there's a live doe in the field, you watch it happen all the time. But yeah. runs across the field and goes and sent checks her. That decoy, same thing. You put that out there, or sometimes I've even used two or three of them. But you'll see the buck from, I mean, a quarter mile, half mile away, like come out to a field and he'll go, oh, there's some does I can check. And they just beeline to it. But, yeah, we're going to be putting up a lot of the video. But I've, you know. Man, th those things are just lightweight and all kinds of decoys work. Don't get me wrong. You know, I tell guys, heck, you know, just like anything else, find a decoy that works for you. But the fact that those Montana decoys are super lightweight, they throw in your pack, you know, it's nothing to just pop one up. I have great luck with them. Well, and that's what I was going to say. I, I love hunting over a decoy, but I've always used full body decoys. And so when, when I was gifted that, I was like, man, it something about it scares me. I'm like, I, I just think that if a buck was to get straight onto it and see that it's 2D, that it would just bolt. It but just all wouldn't... of a sudden it gets thin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, where Here's did it go? Have you seen the video of the bear that attacks the mirror? Almost everybody's seen that. Have you seen the bear that yeah. comes into the bait and attacks the mirror? Yeah. What's that mirror? It's 2D. Yeah. It's true. Watch what the bear does. He attacks the mirror, goes around. Goes at an angle, doesn't see it, comes back around, sees it, and attacks it again. Right. So that's a prime example. And I see what you're saying because, yeah, if you got the decoy on like this, they lose it. But as they start traveling around, they see it again. So, so if I'm you have to you some, when we get off this, I'm going to send you some pictures because you've got to see some of the interactions we've had, like with deer just coming right up to it is hysterical. 
So if you've got the uh, the the buck and the doe, so I've always what I've always tried to do is position the deer, uh, position the buck decoy to be quartering to me. Uh, that way, when the buck decoy or when the buck comes in, he'll be quartering away from me, facing uh, the decoy. So if you have the buck and the doe, and you're using the Montana decoys, if you have those, how do you place the buck and the doe in correlation to where you are? Man, I used to be super funny about that. Like, man, I want to do this. And if the buck does come around nose to nose with the buck or to the head, you know, or if he does this, I've watched so many elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer, and antelope come into decoys. They come in every single different way. It's not a, I mean, I wish I could say, man, it does this every time. They they don't. There's so many variables that come into play there. uh, You know, I'm learning. And it's, it's, it's funny you know if the wind's blowing a certain way they're gonna scent check it a lot you know what i mean which especially a rut buck sometimes he'll swing around man i want to scent check that thing so that's one of the reasons we use some conquest on there just because it smells right but when they're quartering around or circling around to get downwind so i'll i'll place them with the wind in mind with the sun in mind with my shot in mind but i don't think it matters like my biggest thing right. is to put the decoys close enough to where even if the animal I'm after hedges up a little bit, if I'm in a tree stand, for example, that I've still got a shot. When I'm on the right. ground with elk decoys, one, I always think safety. You know what I mean? Like, man, what if some idiot, because I've had people stalk up on my decoys before, but, you know, where do I need this decoy to be so I'm safe if somebody, you know what I mean, uh, you know, thinks it's real and takes a shot at it. So I always, you know, I have that safety in mind, but on the elk decoys a lot, I'll put them behind me. So the elk has to walk right past me to get to the decoy. So I get a super close shot. And, you know, CJ Davis, who's another great guy who's hunted, man, he shot Turkey with me with his recurve. He shot a six by six bull with me. He shot white tail with me. He shot a bunch of stuff, but um, CJ, you know, kind of has done the same thing where he's put that decoy behind him. And as the elk sees it, it's coming to it, you know, he'll make the shot. So, um, yeah, decoys are amazing, but you can play with all kinds of stuff. You know, a lot of it depends if I'm hunting from the ground or an elevated position too, but I wish I, Which, I know uh, that doesn't answer your question, Dylan, but I think as long as you've got those things in close, like the other day I had that mule deer, I think I paced it off. Was it 10 yards? You remember, was it 10 yards? How far was it? 10 or 11 yards from the, from the blind? Yes. 10, I think it was yards. like 10, 10 to 12 yards, something like that from the blind. And my theory was, well, something comes right up to the decoy i'm going to have a 10 to 12 yard shot and if something hedges up a little bit out there you know i'll still have it in range and that mule deer is a prime example you know it came in and matter of fact we're going to put that on motv's just shot uh we'll probably have that video up in a couple weeks but it came in you know literally he's walking right to the decoy and then another buck that had just been at the decoy a smaller buck walks like this the buck turns sideways to look at it and i'm like oh i can make that and and shot him so you know again and that decoy i just had broadside to me and close so that way if they went to scent check it they were going to have to come in in range and if they came straight in they were going to be in range so you know that was it wasn't rocket science i just threw it out there what uh which which conquest sense do you use in 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 conjunction with the decoys you know what vs1 is it's it's expensive but i just bought a bunch of it i mean i've i've had it shipped it's the one that VS1 actually stands for vaginal secretions because it's actually from scrapings from an actual deer. So it's not like a chemical, you know, some stuff is a bunch of chemists get together trying to take something and make it smell right. Um, What I like about the Conquest stuff, they actually have a, they have a herd of deer and they're getting actual scent from deer when they're in estrus. So it smells right. So you know, I got to visit their place one time and it kind of blew me away. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't work with those guys, you know, right now I just love their stuff. Like I buy yeah. it and, dude, uh, but we dude, the it. ever, the, the ever calm is a yeah. game changer. Oh buddy. Yeah. The ever, ever calm elk sense, a game changer, even the rabbit, the coyote scent. So I'm a big believer in sense cause I'm a trapper, uh, grew up trapping. So sense can make a big difference, but I used to be as one, um, whether it's on a mule deer, whether it's on a white tail, just because I think it smells yummy um, to them and, and makes them question what it is. 
So do you do you put that on on both the buck and the doe decoy if you're using both or just good the doe? question? I, I put it on the tail, and yes, if I'm running the buck decoy, I'll put it on him too. Some guys go with buck scent. I go with I go with estrus because I just think, man, I, it just smells better. Yeah, very cool. What is your uh, what's your number one field note? Your your hunting one hundred and one field note uh, that that the listener can take and make themselves a better hunter with. Man. Uh, attitude, go up with a great attitude. I, I, you know, I've driven some cameramen crazy because I'm one of those guys. I'm the internal optimist. You know, I make all yeah. kinds of plans that don't work, Dylan. <laughs> you know, I come up with, man, we're going to do this. You know, even guiding, I'm like, all right, we're going to do this. And when it doesn't work, the guy will look at me like, all right, that didn't work. I'm like, well, today we're going to do this and it's going to work. Yeah. And, you know, if you, if you try enough, it's going to work. So I guess, uh, I, I try and go out there. Even if I'm having a tough hunt, you know, I, I had a cameraman question me one time because we, I think we'd hunted like six days straight and hadn't even seen the animal we were after. And I was so excited to go the next day. And he's like, why are you excited to get back out there? Like, and I'm like, what are the odds? We don't see one today. Like we're increasing yeah. our odds every day. <laughs> yeah. You've got better so, odds on day seven than you did on day one. <laughs> thank you. But some people think reverse of that. And that's, that's because you're a glass half full guy. And most, most bow hunters are, but I think if you're not, you have to be, or you'll quit bow hunting. So, uh, you yeah. know, I think one, if I was to throw out one easy one, you know, or something that, that you got to kind of take to the table and it's man, enjoy it all. Enjoy the sunrises and the sunsets yeah. and the geese flying overhead, the ducks or the hummingbirds that try and put their beak in your feather. And, you know, you'll always have a great time out there. I, uh, I want to share one that, that just, just happened this morning. I was, uh, my hunt had winded down and, and the deer that I had seen in the field, you know, I'd already seen them and they had went off into the woods and there's a sand Creek that runs through here, sand bottom Creek. And I just thought, I'm, you know what, I'm going to get out and I'm just going to still hunt up this Creek and uh super quiet because it's sand. So I can walk through there. And, and I told my buddy, I said, well, we're, we're about to come up to a thick bedding area. And I said, so, so, and he's kind of new to hunting, still learning this. And I said, I don't want to spook the deer as we, as we approach this. And I said, so I'm going to walk pretty quick. And you're going to wonder, why are you walking so quick? And I said, I want to make noise. And he's like, what? And I said, yeah. And so I got my grunt call out and I just held it in my mouth and I'm walking pretty quick and just bleh, 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 bleh. as I'm walking and we get within eight yards of a bedded, nice, nice bedded buck. And, oh. uh, and he was just like, dude, like how, how do we walk so quick? And I said, well, he just thinks we're another deer walking through the woods. And, and, and ended up, it di didn't work out, but, uh, he had a doe that we didn't see facing us between us and him and she blew out and whatever. But anyways, I, so that's a good tip is, is if you're going through the woods, walking through the woods or, you know, I've seen guys who are late to their tree stand and, uh, instead of trying to sneak through there, they just go as fast as they can and just bleh, 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 as they're walking through the woods. And you're not going to spook as many deer that way. Uh, now, of course, if they see you and they're looking at you and th then, yeah, you're done. But um, a pretty decent tip. Also, I I got to share this tip, too. Hair holds scent. Uh, your hair holds scent. And so. Um, <laughs> I nice. Hey, next time you see me, I'll be <laughs> a tip for no. Dylan. I told, I told my wife, guys, listen, I shaved my head because I was losing my hair too quickly for comfort. And so I didn't want to look like one of those guys that was trying to hold on too long. So I just shaved it. But I told my <laughs> wife, I said, listen, I'm going to tell everybody that I'm just that serious of a hunter that I, I wanted as little scent as possible. So I just shaved my head. That's uh, awesome. That's so, awesome. Um, <laughs> uh, guys, I would encourage you now is the time. Um, a now's the time to be hunting a lot of scrapes. Uh, you're getting into the post rut, uh, hunt scrapes. If you've got a scrape, uh, a good community scrape, that's getting hit a lot, sit near it, hunt next to it. If you've got a scrape line, rub line hunt in that area, because those bucks will be frequently checking that. Um, but guys get out there and enjoy the hunt. Uh, I would highly encourage you to check out the Fred Eichler signature series. I would highly encourage you to, uh, Find one and shoot it. I, I know right now they're still uh, really new and hard to get your hands on, but it is a shooter. So find one and shoot it. Uh, Fred, where can they find you at, my friend? Man, uh, I've got a fan page on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, YouTube. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, we've got fredeichler.com. Uh, you can check that out. So, you know, we also have Full Draw Outfitters uh, website on the hunts. We're booked right now. Uh, 
for next year. And I think we've got a couple hunts for uh, 2024 we're, we're doing right now, but uh, yeah, so they can check it out. Check us out on social media or MOTV. Uh, we've got some cool stuff on there from it's, it's brand new hunts. It's hunts that like literally you can find it there before anywhere else. Cause we're videoing it and we're rolling it up on MOTV. It's called just shot. And, and it's stuff that's happened. Like this mule deer will be up there within probably a week or two. Very cool guys. Go check them out. One of my all time favorite personalities and hunters, uh, for the very reason he just said, he's always excited. Um, you know, you watch a lot of guys and it's like, they shoot a deer and they're like, well, we've finally got one down in texas no fred loses his marbles when he shoots a deer and that's what's so exciting about it that's <laughs> that's what i love about it so i remember i think i told you this before but i was right before you signed or right before you announced uh signing on with bear i was down in texas with the guys from bear and they were showing me kind of a video that uh they were going to use and uh the pilot episode or, or uh, whatever you want to call it of you coming to bear and announcing that and uh, I think you shot a doe, maybe even. Uh, it, do you you know the hunt I'm talking about? It was on Alaska. It was kind of in a wide open field. And uh, well, I think was it was it a the, doe. It was a, the Sitka, yeah, that was a Sitka blacktail. It came right up to a Montana decoy. It came like four yeah. yards. And I shot it at like four yards with the cameraman behind me. Yeah. yeah. And and just that that level of excitement, I'm like, man, he shot a doe and he's stinking that he's excited. And that's what hunting should be, guys. Uh, I, I say all that to say this. That's what hunting should be. Uh, don't ever lose the excitement of the hunt because you didn't shoot something Instagram worthy or you're worried about what people will say. Like, just be excited about what you shoot. Be excited about how you hunt. And, and you don't have to you don't have to explain yourself to anybody like you don't have to justify your kill to anybody. I actually ended up shooting a small buck um, just the other day. And I was like, guys, you don't understand me and my son put my son's four and we put in a lot of time trying to kill a deer. And so to do it with my son, didn't care what it was. I didn't care if it was a 200 inch deer or a fork and horn. Like that was incredible and for my son. I mean, he was like, dude, he, he literally said, dad, I want to put his whole body in my room. <laughs> I, I, told him, I told him we could put the head in his room. And he said, I want the whole body in my room. And I said, well, buddy, awesome. I said, we'll eat the meat and we'll put his head in your room. And so now he's <laughs> super excited. And he always asked me, where's my deer head at? Where's my deer head? At? I said, but we got to wait, bud. It's not done yet, but, uh, he's, he's excited. I'm excited. And guys, you don't have to explain yourself to anybody. You shoot what makes you happy. You hunt for the joy of it. And, uh, and that's, that's what it's all about. Hey, I'm going to send you some, some pictures of the, uh, you know, send you some pictures of the uh, decoy stuff. And also, uh, do I need to shave my ass, my legs, my arm hair, all everything? It. All okay. of it. Yeah. That's what I'm going to work on. <laughs> uh, thank you for that tip. You, you, you might have to have Michelle help you get some areas. Yeah, you yeah. See, but... <laughs> might need a team of people. <laughs> she's, she's in the background going, nope. No, uh -uh. no, no. <laughs> nope, not me. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for listening. Y'all have a great week. And as always, get out there and enjoy the hunt.